Hello. Before we get started today, I'd like to do a quick audio test. Can you please use the Q&A box and respond to me if you can hear me? Thanks so much. Hello and welcome to our webinar, Overcoming Enrollment Obstacles, of our series, Adapting to COVID-19, Higher Ed and the Transition to Online Learning. We developed this for college and university faculty and staff to learn tips, tricks, and best practices for this accelerated transition to teaching online and working remotely. Thank you for joining us during these trying times. We hope this webinar series is a useful, valuable you. Please connect with us today using the hashtags MCCWebinar, COVID-19, and Better Together, and visit our website for updates. In today's session, we have four presenters. Our presenters are Giselle Nunez, Liz Gross, Crystal Berry, and Grace Kendall. I will first introduce Giselle. She is an award-winning marketing communications public affairs leader, a dynamic, hands-on, and insightful personal brand expert, and author of Take Charge of Your Brand. She is the Director of Public Relations, Marketing, and Government Relations at, I'm probably not going to pronounce this correctly, Giselle, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to correct me, at Chabot Las Positas Community College District. I will now hand it over to Giselle. Thank you so much, and you did a great job at you know at you know pronouncing our our name because normally that's difficult. The Chabot part is difficult. <laughs> so thank you so much for the invitation to be with you this morning, at least morning time uh, here in the Bay Area in California. So greetings to all. I'm going to click next on the slide. Um, this was just mentioned. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Uh, what we did to pivot very quickly uh, in early March, uh, exactly March 10th, we uh, got the word that we had to now go into shelter in place. We had two days, as many of you did, to turn things around and our marketing strategy that had just been approved a month earlier district-wide, we had two colleges, um, here as part of Chabot Las Positas, and our and, and our marketing strategy, our annual marketing strategy that had just been approved, I realized on March 11th, okay, we're going to have to change a lot of things now uh, because you know most of it does does relate and does present uh, and and is presented in venues where there are people gathered, right? So March 16th, we went into shelter in place. Um, and we've been, uh, and we will continue actually under shelter in place until the end of May, is what the governor just said today. Actually, our counties just said today. Uh, the governor will have more orders coming out later this afternoon. So, nevertheless, the first thing that we had to do was to take a look at all of our platforms. So, phase one of reviewing our marketing strategy ensuring that we had enrollment management in mind was that we uh, basically looked at all of our platforms as part of our strategy and we had to you know we had to modify everything from movie theaters everything from geofencing um, what was it that we needed to to, 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 to change even um, you know the fact that we do have some traditional advertising at four-year college newspapers we had to pivot all of that and move and really move most of our dollars to uh, the to increase our you know digital marketing efforts. So not only were we focusing where we we still needed to focus on recruitment, but we really now had to focus a large part of our efforts on retention as well. <clears throat> so we were uh, so we built 
out our campaign, which was focused on, yes, we have to continue to do some recruitment, but now we really have to up our efforts on retention. And we also have to have add some new audiences as part of our new strategy. So uh, as an example, we added a new track that um, targets parents of high school students. Um, we, um, we, we actually enlarged our footprint with students with four-year college uh, students as well. We also added a track for displaced workers, um, and our and, and our campaign message stays the same, which is uh, which has been which has been the campaign message of investing in you. So invest in you. But now we also added another message, which was we're here for you, right? So which speaks to both the retention piece and the recruitment piece as well. And all of this, I mean, we really had to do in the span of two to three weeks, and then we had to finalize and work through our process here internally um, to get approvals, to get buy-in, um, and, you know, thank goodness for the help of, uh, you know, 25th Hour as well, since they're our extended team, because we're only a team of two here at the district, and our marketing is actually centralized. So in the past three weeks, we really then focused on the creative. So what is this going to look like? Uh, and and uh, it was very helpful to have uh, the guidance of, you know, 25th hour to, to do a lot of the, the quick to implement creatives that, were, that I'm going to show you in just, in just a second here. Uh, but even our, obviously, our, you know, messaging had to pivot as well to now focus on, uh, yes, not only are we still here with a lot of our regular types of programs? But yes, now we're all online. So how do we support you? So really, again, emphasizing the fact that we are here for them. Um, here's what this looks like. Uh, helping the colleges obviously go online as well to um, you know communicate that message. And these are just some examples of uh, what the current hopefully temporary messaging looks like. And these pieces were also turned into four different, actually five different videos. Since we have two different colleges, we normally have a video for each college. And uh, there was a recruitment video, a retention video, and then there was also the uh, displaced workers video, uh, which is that third one that says uh, take the first step towards your next step. So again, all of this started all of this started in, in like en masse March 16th, and it's only April 28th. So it's a little bit over a month, and we have worked so quickly, so quickly to get this out. And there's still so much work to do. I mean, we still have a, a lot of the retention, the a lot of pieces in the world of retention are still with us, and we have to manage that, a lot of withdrawals. So we're analyzing what that looks like and how well we can speak to that audience. Um, so we continue to do the work. We're, uh, we are going to be doing a metrics check on our digital campaigns in about two weeks to see how we need to pivot then, as well as we don't know what the fall is going to look like, as you know, many of you also are, are, are on the same boat, I'm sure. So we don't know how we're going to have to pivot our marketing strategy for that time period at, at this point. Um, if you go to this web link here, you'll, uh, you can see a sample of all of our videos. And I don't know, no, it looks like I can't play the video here that I was going to play. Um, and I don't know if you can do it on the back end. But, you know, nevertheless, it's not, it's not, it's not that important. But um, I, would, I would recommend that you visit that link and, you know, take a look at the videos that we were able to put together uh, that uh, you know represent our new messaging or our new our new look and feel during um, this COVID period where we really had to had to respond quickly to the new market needs. And I think with that, since we can't play the video, right? So we can't play the video on on um, uh, your back end, right? And I'm assuming that's a not. So with that said. I'm going to turn it back over to our host. Thank you so much, Giselle. And sorry, we cannot uh, play it 
on this platform as it okay. is currently. We are working on that, but we can share it with who, whomever signed up for this webinar. We can share it with them via email if that's okay. Perfect. Perfect. And there's that link Thank again you. that said visit to take a look at the videos directly. Thank you so much. We will now go to our next presenter. Campus Sonar is led by Dr. Liz Gross, a recognized expert, data-driven marketer, and higher education researcher. Liz specializes in creating entrepreneurial social media strategies in higher education and has a passion for teaching, which she brings to colleges and universities as the founder and CEO of Campus Sonar. Liz has more than 15 years experience spanning the private and public sector, including the University of Wisconsin campuses in Milwaukee and Waukesha. And in 2013, she launched a successful social listening program at Ascendium, formerly Great Lakes Higher Education Corporation. She received a PhD in leadership for the advancement of learning and service in higher education at Cardinal Stritch University, a master's degree in educational policy and leadership from Marquette University, and a bachelor's degree in interpersonal communication from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. I will now hand it over to Liz. Thank you so much. Uh, in my brief time with you all today, I am going to go over uh, some of the data and insights that Campus Owner has learned from listening to online public student conversation about higher education and the coronavirus and all of the associated operational changes within that. Uh, but just so you have an idea of what, what makes us able to and willing to listen to these things, I wanna share very briefly about Campus Sonar. So Campus Sonar is a social listening agency dedicated to higher education. What that means is that we're finding and analyzing publicly available online conversations from places like Twitter, Reddit, blogs, news, forums, Instagram, Tumblr, and gathering all of that data to provide insights that you can use on campus to better understand your brand, your target audiences, or a topic of conversation, and use that information to build meaningful relationships and work more strategically. So when the coronavirus started impacting campuses seriously, we immediately wondered how exactly can we help? And in early March, we started looking for all of the industry conversation about higher education and the coronavirus from students, from campuses, from news sources. And so far, we have gathered and analyzed over 6 million conversations about higher education and COVID-19. Uh, to give you an idea of what that looks like on a daily basis, uh, the green bar on the slide you're seeing right here is the number of mentions in the industry we found every single day. So it started over 400 and 500,000 mentions early in March when campuses were just starting to close and then has moved on to a more standard um, about 30 to 90,000 mentions a day. And about a third of those are focused very much on higher education, the roles of campuses in their communities, looking towards the future, whereas some of the others are overarching stay at home initiatives and then how they happen to impact college campuses. Uh, this is an industry level scan. So we are not looking for specific names of colleges or universities. We are just looking for these general higher education terms. One of the things we like to share is where this conversation is happening. Um, and we are not undercover spies. Again, this is all in publicly available online conversation. But when we look at this, those, that portion of the conversation that is focused very much on what is happening on and from campuses, the majority of it appears on social media. We're regular, regularly seeing between two-thirds and three-quarters of this conversation on places like Twitter, which is the largest online data source. But we're also seeing conversations on forums like Reddit and College Confidential, blogs, particularly Tumblr, which we found is an actually a very active source of conversation during this, this time, and of course, news. And over time, we've seen some of those more longer forms of content, like forums, Reddit, blogs, and Tumblr, um, start to take away some of the role that social media plays. But where it really becomes interesting is when you start to zero in on the students in the conversation. 
So on the left, you're seeing the same graph I just showed you, but on the right, you are seeing the distribution of mentions where someone clearly uh, conveys in that content that they are a student at an institution of higher education. And there we see the social media mentions drop dramatically. It's usually only a quarter to a third of mentions, and students are spending much more time on forums like Reddit, uh, blogs like Tumblr, sharing their stories, sharing their frustrations, their concerns, and those long form areas are where we can really pull out some insights. To give you an idea of what this looks like from a volume standpoint, when we look at all of those six million mentions we've seen so far, any given week, somewhere between four and 8% of those message mentions are ones that we can identify as students. So we want to make sure that we are highlighting those hidden voices, the students and the admitted students and their parents who are sharing their experience during this time and what it means to them. There's some high level trends from what we're seeing at current student topics. Now, we generally don't know if these are four year campus students or community college campus students, but these are the general trends that we are seeing overall from current students. They're sharing online in places that you really might not expect. And that first briefing we saw, uh, I think it was about two thirds of students conversation was on Tumblr. And this was a social network that a lot of campuses had written off in the past, uh, but it was a, certainly a good source of, of insight and a view into the student experience. And we're also seeing lots of conversation on Reddit. Young adults are the largest growing demographic of the discussion site Reddit, which is one of the top 10 um, websites in the United States. So we see a lot of things there. We're also doing some emotional analysis on this. So using algorithms, we can determine what emotions students are displaying in their posts. And every single week when we've done this analysis since March 11th, the pr prominent emotions of students have been sadness and anger. They are grieving the experience that they've lost and they're angry about how it has affected their lives, their finances, and in some cases, their progress towards education. Some of those specific situations I'm sure are not surprising to you, finances, mental health, and basic needs when students have lost uh, on-campus positions or you know, jobs in, in, a, in an area where they've moved back home from, those are all ongoing concerns. And we see their stories spreading via word of mouth. This happens a lot on Tumblr, a little bit on Twitter, where their unique experiences are just instantly shared with their networks, and we see a lot of spread there from the student perspective. And then the last thing trend I wanted to hit on is that these students are expressing themselves with memes, those short, uh, potentially funny ways of expressing an idea or an emotion. And I think we could all use a laugh these days so I wanted to share two of the top memes that we saw about students' online classes. Um, this first one we just called a thousand emails about classes. It's a standard meme where someone will take an out of context video clip and give it their own quote. So in this video, some of you who are parents might really uh, empathize with this video. A toddler is sad and she's crying and she's playing with a Nerf gun and she accidentally points points the Nerf gun towards her instead of away from her, while already sad and crying, shoots the Nerf gun into her face and just doesn't injure herself, but just her level of sadness gets incredibly elevated. And when a student saw this, they said, this is how I feel when a teacher sends a thousand emails about online classes. Uh, another popular meme was someone just simply saying, is it me or is online classes more confusing than actual school. I put actual school in quotes, but we can see here through a meme that students are actually thinking about the online class experience as something completely different than what they signed up for. And that is something and it was an insight that we can take away from. I also briefly want to touch on trends from admitted students. So we are seeing people saying that they've been accepted or they've made a decision to attend somewhere. And then overwhelmingly, they're sharing thoughts of anxiety of if they should enroll, how they'll pay tuition, if they or their parents have been impacted by job loss or hours reduction, how they can choose a campus if they can't visit. 
if they should move far away from home, if they're not sure if they're going to be able to have a full experience or have full access to travel. And then we are starting to see people ask, I was planning to attend a four-year college. Should I attend community college instead? And what might that look like? And those of you that read Inside Higher Ed might have seen the Dean Dad column today where he made a very compelling case where students could be considering community college instead of what a, an, an unproductive gap year might look like. So I'm actually going to be paying close attention to how community college shows up in these situations. We have some interesting examples of how admitted students have been responded to by institutions who are paying attention. So this last example I'll share is a tweet from a student who was intending to tour the campus at Purdue, but of course her college visit was canceled. Her family got together and like made all these little makeshift Purdue stations on campus so the student could feel like they had toured. She tweeted this, and both Purdue University's flagship account and the nursing account, which is where she was applying for admission, responded to her and you know made her feel welcome. And then if you would go to this on Twitter, there is just a thread of folks who are giving her support even though she can't come to the campus. So it's important to find these online opportunities where you can engage folks who are talking about experiences they may have missed. If you'd like to dive deeper, into any of our insights about the coronavirus and online conversation. Campus Sonar does put out a free briefing every single Tuesday. We just published our last one about an hour ago. Uh, you can find that at info.campussonar.com slash COVID-19. And you can also look at the archive of every briefing we have put out since March 11th. They're all freely available. You don't have to give us your email address. You're welcome to jump in and use them to inform your strategies. And if you have feedback or questions, absolutely let me know and we might be able to work those into a future briefing. I'm going to turn it over to our host. Thank you so much. And I did forget to mention at the beginning, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box and we will get to those at the end. We will now move on to Crystal Berry. She's the Vice President of 25th Hour Communication. our communications and works with almost each of the company's 158 higher education clients. She's an experienced media buyer and marketing manager with more than 15 years of experience in the higher education industry. Crystal has presented over the last 10 years to President Cab throughout her career on topics such as cutting edge technology and social media and digital enrollment strategy and continues to create and implement award-winning collateral and campaign for her clients. I have to add, she's a very good partner of ours. She makes great connections for us and we greatly appreciate her. So Crystal, I'll hand it over to you now. Hi, well thank you so much everybody for having us today. We're excited to be here. Uh, this is a really great webinar series and um, again, love partnering with MCCA. They think outside the box, they bring content, um, to just about any higher education role um, that is out there. And I love that they are so inclusive in just not only thinking about enrollment, but, you know, some of these other things, mental health, um, you know, and, and where community colleges and where, you know, four-year universities should really be right now, especially in the Midwest. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the handoff. Um, what I would like to go over with you is that, you know, that we have some enrollment obstacles, but I would really like to share these two very quick to implement retention and recruitment campaigns for fall, looking at how to mobilize for fall recruitment again and retention um, with some just very easy, quick to implement pieces. Uh, information about these can be, you know, uh, requested of Kaylin after this if you'd like some more information. Uh, but this is what's working with our community colleges and our higher education uh, clients across uh, the country. And again, quick to implement with just a few lists to pull. Um, and so let's just dive right on in. Okay. All right. So first we're looking at, this is about, a, you know, anywhere between a 5.5 five and maybe 6.15 mark. We know a lot of fiscal years and 6.30 for um, higher education. Some have a different uh, lay of the, of the land, but generally our fiscal year ends 6.30. So we want to push this through. We want to push for fall. Um, some summer enrollment might, might be happening right now. I don't want to confuse that. I'm sure that those that have moved forward with summer and fall advertising, you're probably pushing your summer piece right now. This is going to be a little bit different, and we're actually going to focus on fall. 
um, because we really want to open that pipeline and get as many qualified candidates in that funnel as possible. When I work with community colleges, I get a lot of people who call and say, um, and you know, even four-year universities say things along the lines of, we just don't know how we, what the modality will be for fall classes. Will it be, um, you know, online? Will it be remote uh, live? What does that look like and what are those differences? Um, and we can't really do our marketing until we know. And the, 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 the end of the day, you guys, we have to be open for business. This is what is going to train this you know, nation to work through this pandemic. We are going to give them work set skills, training skills, upgrade their job skills. We're going to help those displaced workers. We are going to also help any of those small business, um, small businesses that have gone under. Um, so this is our kind of chance to do that. So we're going to have a two-prong approach to this quick to implement plan. This generally can run about 30 to 40 days. If you're not behind the curve, you could still get started by about 10, 5, 10, and you could go all the way to 6, 15. What I'm going to show with you, uh, show you here on the next few slides would be a little bit about um, how we can, you know, pivot ourselves to current students to make sure that they enroll before they leave. Um, everybody is out there with online programming, so how can you make yourself different? And then using some of those college provided lists that don't cost the cost of college anything and are actually warm leads and higher converters. So looking at the first one, we can do some custom audience targeting. Um, so what we will do is use Facebook and Instagram custom audience feature. We will also use the current student um, list and do a custom audience on our geospatial or geofence provider. You should have somebody in your media mix, um, either your agency or maybe if you're doing some of this in-house. Um, what you would need is pretty simple. So looking at this as a two-platform piece, this is just to retain your current students from uh, spring to say summer or to fall. And um, I think what's great about this is that, you know, you can work with your, uh, with your admissions and records or registrar's office to pull that current student list, first name, last name, email address, and that personal email address is really important, um, cell phone number, and then a mailing address. No student IDs because we don't want to be in violation of FERPA. Uh, so as long as you are using uh, college provided lists and the student ID information is not um, tied to that student on that list, you are, you are um, good to go because you are basically pulling directory information. Why that personal email list is important is because we are going to use that to match users with their Facebook and Instagram accounts. So it's not that that email uh, field can't be a college provided email address, but we know commonly that these Facebook and Instagram accounts will be associated with personal email addresses. So what we're going to do is run a 30 day campaign. We are going to build a Facebook campaign, a Facebook and Instagram campaign with your custom audience to your current student list. And we're going to serve those matched accounts with ads very specific to them. So we can say, hey, Pathfinders, or hey, whatever your mascot is, hey, Trailblazers, hey, Tigers, hey, you know, thanks for, you know, we're here to help you. Make sure you sign up and get your classes for fall before you leave for the summer. Check it off your list, um, that kind of thing. So we want to remind them that we're here for them. We want to support them and let them know that we're here to get them basically in the pipeline for fall, get the classes they need. Some colleges do offer a priority registration for current students or continuing students. So if you have anything to offer them to get them to sign up before they leave for summer, it's really important that we do that. So we'll be serving them with Facebook and Instagram ads written specifically to them, reminding them to register before they leave. And then we'll also, the second part of this is going to be um, a geofence part of the campaign. And what we'll do is we'll take that same current student list, and we will actually take the household addresses off that list. And what we'll do is we will reverse IP target those households. And so basically, we're going to be putting up a geofence around each one of those houses. And we are going to serve devices in those houses with that. We know a lot of people have moved back home. Um, we're going to ping those current student addresses, and we're going to send um, ads to all the devices in the home. So they're going to see an ad on Facebook, and then they're maybe working on an app on their phone. They might be looking at something on the Internet, and they'll be served an ad on their mobile device, on their laptop, on their desktop, um, and even their connected TV. So looking at that, 
um, you know, we do just want to um, say, you know, these current student lists are important. So that's prong one. Um, again, copy of that message, copy of what that retention looks like. Now let's talk a little bit about your applied, not registered list. This could also be your stop out list, those that have started but stopped out, not just this semester, but maybe over the last four or five semesters. Same setup, you guys, this is a custom audience kind of go-to for us. This is a go-to campaign model. We get that applied not registered list and that stop out list and we'll start serving them with custom messages on Facebook and Instagram. Also doing that same thing, doing that reverse IP address um, targeting to each and every single one of those households. Um, and this is, this, this is just, these are just messaging concepts I wanted to share, but something along the lines of, since you have to stay at home, why not register now for summer and fall? You have plenty of time to choose what might be, um, what you might want to be. Sit back, relax, apply. You can do it all online right where you are. So, you know, just kind of working um, with those messages, understanding that people will be home, um, and we want to make it as easy as possible to get them in that pipeline. Applied not registers and stopouts are pretty uh, I, we like to call them warmer leads or higher converters. You don't have to introduce yourself to them. Uh, they already know who you are. They've been in the system. So now it's our time to kind of recover um, some of those. And quite honestly, those applied not registers from last summer and fall might have been students getting ready to go off to a four year and they might now be that um, opportunity. And going back to the presenter before me, talking about this opportunity for four year enrollment and these freshmen that are going into, I get calls all the time from just friends and that are parents of high school seniors and also colleagues that are there's an opportunity here to really discuss how do we serve those that maybe have been in line for four-year freshmen starting this fall um, and now parents quite frankly might not want to pay for a college experience for their child to take classes in the other room online and so we have a lot of that so that really hit on this opportunity here Focusing on transfer as the end goal, you can also take those applied not registered and you can do some work with that and let them know that, hey, did you try, you know, is a four-year university, if year one didn't go, okay, you know, consider us, that kind of thing. Um, or consider us this fall if you're looking at deferring the enrollment um, for your, for your uh, college freshmen this year. We're here to help. We're here to support you. Our credits transfer. Um, and so we'll want to make sure to include those also in some of these messages. Now, because these are custom audiences, these are great opportunities for you to be running campaigns at the same time because you won't really have any crossover. I do want to share with you some really great um, pieces I've pulled off Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we have, you know, what's really working is naming the timing in your campaign images. Complete in as few as 12 months. Six month medical billing and coding. Get your, you know, so-and-so certificate in eight weeks, in 12 weeks. We know with the uncertainty of where things are at, people want to either upgrade their job skills, start a new job, or get a better job. Also looking at people that are looking at second career choices. Um, the timing piece here is becoming a trend, and it's becoming very common. So to make yourself stick out, um, as to what kind of opportunities you'll be able to offer, keep in mind that timing. These short-term work um, training um, opportunities are going to be really good. And they don't have to just think outside the box a little bit. Um, if you look at my screen, you'll see the middle image, online training for movement marketers. That speaks to some, um, some online influencer marketing. That's kind of a new thing. Honestly, it could be a very basic four to six week um, marketing certificate, but by the way they presented it, calling it movement marketer online training, and then down below you'll see the copy is you know, six weeks, 12 months, whatever that may be. That's been kind of an interesting trend. Also looking at the culinary piece, um, that um, the culinary copy on the left hand side that is a, a school that has, is figuring out ways to offer online classes for something that traditionally would have to be face-to-face. -face. Now that steps up a little bit. That's talking about modality and class offerings, which usually happens at, the, um, you know, at a college leadership level. But what I will say is very, um, very forward thinking. You know, hey, we, yes, you heard us. We said culinary and we figured out how to offer it online. If you have some opportunities, um, 
If you have some opportunities to do some online stuff that maybe has never been online, um, but you can give it a twist and maybe offer that first semester online or something like that, step out and say that. I think that's really important. Uh, the timing, the blues, we know that that's the blue, the solid colors with um, images of actually class work or icons. Um, you'll see in some of, um, uh, you saw in the Chabot Las Positas Community College District with their graphics, they had solid colors, icons, and to the point messaging. This is not probably an opportunity where we want to share student photos of them on campus. We're unsure of how that might look for fall. And then just as a wrap up, um, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about services that promote equity and access. It's a huge word, especially in higher education. Equity and access is becoming even more apparent when we're realizing students have to Zoom from home, you know, have to Zoom from somewhere where they might have to pick up an internet, um, an internet connection that they might not have readily available. Um, so wanting to make sure that we talk to barriers and that we look at services um, and maybe putting some of those service options on your landing pages where you're sending people for um, recruitment and retention, obviously a plus. Your college provided list, like I said, this shouldn't cost you anything. As long as you pull correct information, you'll be com in compliance with FERPA um, and working from there. And one thing that we really promote is making sure that whenever you do have a paid campaign going forward for enrollment, we always have some email and social media to back that up. So it, it, that no cost piece is really important looking at email social media campaigns using some of the same copy that is in your paid campaign. Google loves to see the relevancy and so does Facebook. And so in their algorithms, when you have social media posts going out and you have some paid ads that are running some of that same type of language, it'll create your quality score. Um, it'll actually make it go up. You'll pay less per click. Just a few other items here. Timing and new takes on common programs. I shared that with you. Video, quick to implement videos, uh, you know, 15 seconds, you know, maybe 30 seconds at the most. Calm faces of leadership. If you get an opportunity to go up to Chabot Las Positas or um, Chabot or Las Positas uh, landing pages, I think they're well, slash welcome 2020, there's a video at the top for um, each leader of that college did a calm video and an update to students. So when they land, they can watch that video. Um, and then just as I had said that there are some custom audiences here, opportunities for your geospatial or geofence provider, as well as Facebook and Instagram, just know that text messaging campaigns are uh, also a possibility and you can do the same sort of custom audience on Snapchat as well. So, you know, some people will say, well, we don't have a Snapchat account or we don't have, um, you know, we don't want to, we're not, we're trying to get working adults. We don't need to be on Snapchat. We have a lot of data behind us that says that you can pretty much reach just about everybody on Snapchat. And especially if you're uploading a custom list, it's only going to serve ads to those that are on that list that they can match with that Snapchat account. So depending on when your budget is available, this quick to implement plan that I showed you with the two prongs um, can also be extended upon once you get comfortable putting it together. Um, and so that's it. That's my, those are my slides. And if you guys, like I said, have any questions, we'll, we'll wait for the end, but I'm excited to hear feedback. Thanks, Kaylin. Thanks so much, Crystal. And if you're not supposed to be on Snapchat as an adult, I don't think I want to be an adult. I love Snapchat. <laughs> so we will now move Same. on to our next presenter. <laughs> we will move on to our next presenter. Grace Kendall is the Director of Marketing and Communications for Peninsula College in Port Angeles, Washington. She has been marketing higher education for the last five years and has 20 years of experience experience as a graphic design professional where her work has been published, shown, and awarded. She is also an educator and taught for more than 10 years. Grace has worked as a coordinator for design multimedia at a center for teaching and learning at a university, the lead digital media instructor in the graphic communications program at a community college, an art director at an ad agency, a senior designer and co-director of a planning and marketing department at a health services company, taught college level design courses to high school students, developed first year seminar curriculum, and was adjunct faculty at a university, and was an artist for the installation of a permanent immersive environment exhibit in Chicago. Grace earned her MFA in graphic design from Cal Arts, a post BACC certificate in visual communication from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and a BS in biology from San Diego State University. 
great to you. Thank you, Kaylin, and good afternoon to the invisible audience. <laughs> this is always a little awkward. Technology is fantastic, but it does feel a little strange to be sitting in my bedroom presenting to an invisible group. But I did want to thank you all today for the opportunity to join you. Before I share with you some examples of how we're addressing enrollment obstacles at Peninsula College through messaging and marketing, I want to give you some context on the location of Peninsula College and how the COVID-19 situation unfolded for us in higher ed with Washington State being the initial epicenter. So on your screen, you'll see uh, two maps. The smaller map in the upper right is uh, Washington State. And the larger map shows a inset of Western Washington zoomed into my general area. So you'll see the green arrow is pointing to Port Angeles. Uh, Port Angeles and Peninsula College is a small college in a rural and remote location. There's about 95,000 in our service district. Um, there's an entire county and then a portion of a second county is who we serve. We have a main campus in Port Angeles, and then we also have two extension sites. Each is about 50 miles in the opposite direction from our main campus, and we also have two correction centers. Our total enrolled headcount, including our inmate students, is about 3,800. So to the right of the Port Angeles green arrow, you can see a yellow-orange arrow pointing at the Seattle area. So you know, even though looking at the map, we don't seem that far away. Um, it is about two to four hours travel time from Port Angeles to Seattle, depending on what combination of highways, ferries, bridges, and other transportation options that you take. Um, so even though Seattle is a far distance away, we, you know, we're in this same local general area. And exactly two months ago today on February 28th, one of our community and technical colleges in the state uh, Lake Washington Institute of Technology had nursing students and faculty that had been at the life care center in Kirkland um, and they ended up having to close the school um, because of the COVID-19 outbreak and the exposure that those students and those faculty had. Um, I am grateful that I am in a state where our 34 community and technical colleges work together um, we support each other, we collaborate with each other, we have meetings three times a year. So the Public Information Commission that supports us all and provides resources to us all um, was really instrumental in those early days for us to be able to see what the other colleges in our system in that Seattle and the wider Puget Sound area were experiencing, the messages they were needing to give out, um, and what was happening to their students and their community to, to help guide us in, in the choices that we were going to make. Um, Peninsula College, we are in week nine of our incident management, um, and the county also is in week nine of our emergency operations center. So given that context and that situation, how do you message in that? So at Peninsula College, we really focused on messaging with warmth and support. Um, we wanted to be the college that our students and our community needed us to be. Um, so rather than starting our messaging with enrollment, um, because we did delay the start of our spring quarter by uh, a week, um, we stopped the ads that we were running we did change the date of when the quarter started, but it was really important to us that our first message to our students and to our community was a message of, we got you. Followed up by a second message that we have services to support you, and then a third message for enrollment. So here's an example of one of those we got you messages. We put together a very simple video. Um, our faculty and staff took photos of themselves in their homes or around their homes in their yards. Uh, we wrote the script and 
gave each person the bits of the script that we wanted them to write on a piece of paper and take a selfie of themselves. And then we put these photos together so that it read the script there on the left that you can see. It says, we're thinking of you. A family sticks together, together no matter the challenge. Your Peninsula College family is here for you every step of the way. No matter what happens next, we have your back. PC is here to support you. PC will lead the way through this crisis and beyond. And then the final slide is our president um, holding the two hashtags. PC family is a new hashtag that we started using with messaging um, since the COVID-19 outbreak. And then PC proud is a hashtag that we've been using for quite some time um, to, for engagement and um, to support our students with showing our pride as a Peninsula College um, community. So this video was released the first week of spring quarter to students. Um, it was important to us that we be thoughtful about the order of our messaging. This was a video that faculty and staff put together for our students. So we wanted it to go to them first. And then it was quickly followed up by sending it out to faculty and staff through our college email and then it also went out on our college social media account. Once we ran that for the first week of spring quarter, we followed that up with running it as a paid social ad. We wanted that to get out to our wider community. We ran it for about a month uh, as a way to let our community know also what we were doing and that we were here for them. So this was a really great response from this. Um, everything from email replies within the college, social media engagement, sharing of the video, and it also inspired other Washington Community Colleges to make a similar video. So that was a really powerful statement and we were really glad that we started with that. So our messaging with warmth and support uh, continued. We continue to push out supportive and caring messages in all of our communications and all of our marketing efforts. Um, so things, everything from a spring quarter resources page that we put together for our students, like I believe pretty much every other college in the country has done with the transition to online classes. Um, but we also put that supportive video uh, example that I was just speaking about on the top of that page. So it's right there for our students to see. Uh, we also had supportive and caring messaging in our delayed commencement announcement, our CARES Act emergency funding, um, and other communications that are going out to students, as well as our, our marketing messaging. So our social media posts, uh, we have a quarterly publication that is currently being printed that will start hitting um, 50,000 plus mailboxes here in about a week, um, and the enrollment ads that we are running as well. So I wanted just to give a couple of examples of how we are addressing enrollment obstacles through marketing. And one of those ways is something that Crystal just spoke about. We're using custom audience marketing, um, using enrollment marketing by pulling our own college lists. So these are uh, the names, addresses, phone numbers, emails um, of our students that either are already taking classes with us um, or students that have applied but have not registered yet. So they're already in the pipeline. So on the left, you'll see an example of an ad that we sent to our the list of currently enrolled students. Um, so the messaging there is, is pretty small, so I'll, I'll read it to you. Peninsula College is committed to you. We are here and we have online classes for spring so you can stay home and stay healthy. We're changing how we do things so we can keep supporting you. Register now and start April 13th. So this is an example of the spring ads that we started to run once we had to pivot our marketing for the COVID-19 outbreak. And because we delayed the start date, we had a little bit more time to get some students enrolled for spring quarter. 
And this was really easy for us to do. We were able to pull those lists internally, um, and then Crystal at 25th Hour was able to help us with the messaging, with the creative, and get this out on social media very quickly. The other group that we sent ads to was to students that had already applied to the college um, but had not registered yet. So they were somewhere in that enrollment pipeline. So we wanted to capture those students and send them a message letting them know that it wasn't too late. So this one reads, you have applied to Peninsula College, but you haven't registered for spring quarter yet. We are here and we have online classes for you. Register now and start April 13th. So using this strategy to get students who were already in our pipeline, that were already here at the college, um, has had fantastic results. Um, our spring enrollment is flat. We were expecting a significant dip in enrollment, and we were quite surprised to see that our enrollment did not drop as we had expected. So that is my presentation. Um, I'm guessing there might be some questions out there, so I will turn it over back to Kaylin, and I look forward to answering questions that the audience members might have. Thanks so much, and perfect segue. We do have some questions. Um, our first one is for Liz. Do you have any insight to students considering transferring or taking at least one semester off due to the current crisis? That is an excellent question. Um, I don't like to speak when I don't have the data <laughs> to back it up. Uh, we haven't done any specific analysis on the conversations around transfer yet, but one of the, the trends I've seen and we reported about in today's briefing um, is that there's a lot of hearsay, um, particularly um, on Reddit and, and other forums, of what people are hearing as possible regarding fall uh, from a lot of other um, non-official sources at institutions. And I think that anything, any messaging that can support um, any guaranteed transfer agreements that you have in place or transfer pathway resources that you have so that students can feel assured that what they're doing is going to get them where they want to go will be helpful because a lot of them are making their decisions right now based on rumor and hearsay and anything they can point to as an official source will help them feel more confident. Thank you. And our second question, what specifically are you doing for pre-enrollment through activities and communications? Feel free, any presenter that would like to answer to, to jump on. Caitlin, can you clarify please for that on that question? Is it events to you know to kind of answer what you need? Sorry, you, you cut out there. Here, I'll read it one more time. What specifically are you doing for pre-enrollment through activities and communications? I hope that clarifies a little. Sure. I can just tell you, this is Crystal, and I can just give a brief, and then I can definitely let anybody else jump in that, that would like to. As far as um, normal communication um, of events that we would have, you know, we would have um, open house, and we would have people come to campus, because we know once we get in there that the opportunity to really recruit them um, becomes a lot better. Um, and so we're working with high school counselors to put on, in some of these colleges we're working with, we're working with high school counselors to put on some virtual events, some using some drone footage to do some 3D campus tours, um, in action, that kind of thing. We're using some student ambassadors who are um, using their, you know, home computers and then showing how they're kind of working from home um, and, and, and staying enrolled from home. And so we're really trying to, you know, utilize whatever opportunity we can, but it seems as though this um, relationship with high school counselors, because we can't be out in the high schools, they've been really receptive on how we can kind of put together some Zoom meetings, some senior night meetings, where we can have different representatives from the colleges available. Um, so these are just some things that we're doing. I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm hoping that that speaks to it. 
Hi, this is Grace from Peninsula College. Um, one of the things that we're doing for, for pre-enrollment is you know, we're trying to keep things kind of as normal as possible. Um, so certainly there are some tweaks that we've had to do, but you know, just being out there and supporting our students, letting them know that we're here, we're available for them, all of our services are available online, um, we've pivoted our food pantry and they can do a drive up service now instead of visiting the pantry in person. Um, our bookstore was delivering books to people's home, homes that were local. Um, we even took one of our advanced ceramics classes and delivered uh, wheels to students individual addresses. So, you know, pivoting and being as creative as we can given the situation, but also trying to keep things just as, as normal as possible um, is something that we've been really focusing on. Thank you both. Our next question, where should we place our focus, recruiting or retaining students? So this is Giselle, and perhaps uh, I can say again what we're doing. Um, so we are doing a combination of both, the retention and the recruitment, right? Um, and, and, there's, and, and obviously within those two segments, you can build out five to ten different target audiences just within those two segments. So for the retention piece, we may not be able to, as an example, focus on those that are, um, you know, withdrawing um, under, under uh, you know, extraordinary circumstances for COVID because there may be some very personal reasons of why they can't continue. But there are some other target audiences within those, those, those students that perhaps um, we can help them by providing them with, uh, with um, needs around, you know, technology, around financial aid or such, right? So that, they're re so that perhaps we can retain them if they know that we have certain support services available to them. Um, so definitely, so I'm not going to necessarily say it's one or the other. I think you can do both. We're doing both for that reason because we don't want to lose a lot of students that are maybe on the verge, on the cusp of withdrawing simply because their needs, because they think they cannot be supported and we essentially do have support services for them, they just aren't aware of them, such as the technology, such as the financial aid needs, it could be food insecurity or, you know, things of that nature. So that's for the retention piece. And then for the recruitment piece, we're really, again, not changing anything of what we had already had, uh, of what we had uh, planned to do, in it, but we did add, as I mentioned earlier, some additional target audiences to meet and to hopefully speak to the new market needs um, of those of those prospective students. Well, of, of that population that now become more of our prospective students, um, such as again the high school senior, the parents specifically were targeting them differently than than perhaps than we were before. The four-year college uh, students, we always have targeted them, but now we're just doing it a little bit differently, right? Um, the displaced worker, uh, we have targeted them differently in the past, more under CTE, but now we're targeting them more under um, sort of what Crystal mentioned, uh, focused on programs with uh, end dates, start dates, end dates, right? So they can feel like they have a goal to accomplish and have something tangible to finish. Um, so that would be, my answer is we need to focus on both and there's different ways of doing that. And, and it may be that you just have to also t tweak your audiences and your messaging to each uh, just a little bit more right now. So, so those would be my thoughts to that question. This is Grace so uh, from Peninsula College. Hi, this is Grace from Peninsula College. I'll just I'll piggyback on what Giselle said because we are we're doing the same things. Um, we're focusing both on retention of students that are already 
already currently enrolled or those that are already in the pipeline um, by some of the examples that I shared with you, some of the custom audience marketing. We will continue to be pulling lists for summer and for fall and doing some of those same targeted social media marketing to those types of students along with continuing to support them and ease some of their concerns and fears with the supports that we're offering them, um, including things like CARES Act funding um, and other emergency funding that the college might have, things that we've already had in place for them. Um, and then as far as recruiting goes, you know, we are doing some of the same things that we had been planned for, but tweaking them a bit, as Giselle said, tweaking the messages and tweaking some of the tactics. But we're also trying to be nimble and responsive and try some new things. One of the things that we're trying right now is um, something called a university look back, where we were able to, with the, the help of Crystal at 25th Hour and Digital Dynamics, put up a geofence at the universities and four-year colleges that are nearby us in Western Washington, um, and then put another geofence up around our service district. And what that does is it captures the mobile devices of potential students that had been attending a university or a college in the last 30 days but then have come back into our service district, and then we can serve them very targeted ads. Um, you know, maybe those university students are home for summer. Maybe those university students are considering not going back to their college or university in the fall because they'd prefer to stay close to home. Um, maybe there are parents that were visiting their students um, and they're also getting that same message from us of, hey, you know what, it's, it's okay to stay home. It's okay to stay close. Um, you can take classes here locally at a fraction of the cost, and we can support you here close to home. So I know it, it's, it's a lot. Um, it's definitely a challenge. It's definitely difficult um, to be focusing both on recruiting and retention especially with the variety of messages that need to go out, the variety of targeted audiences, um, but it is absolutely doable. Thank you. Our next question, our dollars are already minimal. Where should I spend, digital or local newspapers and radio? Our president likes to hear the messages on the radio, but I don't know if that's effective. If I know Crystal, she might tell you to use Snapchat, <laughs> but feel free to jump in. Sure. Yeah, this is Crystal. Hey, you know what? Um, you know, we're trying to get to influencers right now, um, especially if you're dealing with any sort of, um, like right now we're dealing with, um, you know, a lot of displaced workers, a lot of people that might be in the field for, uh, for community college enrollment that maybe weren't necessarily before. Um, so here's the problem with local radio. When you get into some of these larger areas, um, people aren't driving to work right now. So that drive time that you would normally get in the morning and on the way home, um, you're not going to get. So what we do find is that older audiences still do listen to the radio at home, which does really fit that displaced worker um, piece. And we do know that people working from home might also be kind of listening to some of their local um, AM and FM radio, but oftentimes they're actually just going to be streaming, um, like on a Snapchat, I'm sorry, on a Spotify or some sort of Pandora um, or XM radio, Sirius radio. So I think you should be in digital because it allows you to be very fiscally responsible with your targeting. You can say, I want to reach 35 to 65 year olds for this specific program in these specific zip codes, or you, know, you really have some targeting capabilities that make that dollar work for you more than once. The other thing I would share with your president is that with digital, you will have data. Again, another way for this dollar to work for you more than once, you'll be doing marketing, but you'll be getting some data behind what messages did well, what type of images did well. And that's stuff that can then signal the stuff that you can, you know, it can signal what copy you might use, you know, going forward um, 
on a traditional campaign or with a newspaper ad going forward. Um, I wouldn't recommend newspaper at this time. I, it's not that it doesn't work. I just feel, and in some very rural areas, it, it probably is beneficial to post something to show your community you're there for them. Um, again, when it gets really expensive um, or when you're in a little bit more of a metro area, that can be difficult and it can be lost. Um, so our recommendation is, you know, there may be some older audiences listening at home. Um, we have, and in, in especially Giselle knows this, we're doing local radio um, for um, some of our larger Hispanic communities, some of our Vietnamese communities, where we know that those um, uh, influencers are tuning in and listening to the radio. Um, but again, your digital is going to give you data and targeting, which makes that dollar work for you more than once. This is Liz. I would jump in really quickly and add, you know, what Crystal said about drive time, drive time being down, podcast listening is also down, which could translate to radio. The use of social media is up across all demographics, um, as is web browsing, and there are third-party reliable sources you can use to show how that is a way to be adaptive right now to adapting, uh, ad adapting consumer behaviors. Interesting. Thank you both very much. We did have a, a question pop in that I want to jump to um, just in case geofencing comes up again. Um, but can one of you please, please explain what geofencing is? Absolutely. Um, so geofencing can be described in a lot of different ways. Generally, if you can just imagine that if there was somewhere that you wanted to target that you thought a lot of your potential students um, were, there would be an opportunity for you to put up, you know, these digital fences around some of these locations. So in the past, we have used geofence to target places like competing colleges or hospitals or car dealerships where people are waiting or dentist office or WIC offices or unemployment offices or bus stops. Um, you really, any place that we thought prospective students might, um, might gather. What Grace was talking about with that university look back piece is we can actually go back 30 days and we can actually see what devices were in certain locations 30 days ago. So we did a university look back where we put up fences around the universities trying to target those students who have had to move home after spring break not really knowing what their fall is going to look like. Um, and we're just presenting them with low cost options, come to Peninsula College or come to whatever college it may be. Um, you know, if you're going to take classes online, you might as well pay less doing it, um, that kind of thing. So um, at, at a first glance, Geofence is just putting up a digital fence around a location that you can capture devices and then serve those devices with ads. That's a little bit different now with the social distancing and the stay-at-home directives. There's not really an opportunity to go to malls, movie theaters, and geofence some of these places where our, our prospective students gather. So what we've done is we really relied on the custom audience feature of that, which is in taking those lists and actually putting up a little digital fence around every single house and serving those houses with ads, just like we would, um, like I said, a bus stop or, or a WIC office or something along those lines. So in general, it's just basically putting up some sort of digital parameters around a place that you want to capture devices and serve ads to. Thank you, Crystal, for, cl for clearing that, clarifying that for us real quick. Um, our next question, how involved is your president or chancellor with the communication strategy during this time? Hi, this is Grace at Peninsula College. I, I can tell you what's happening at, at our college. Um, so we don't have a chancellor. We have a president, and he is mostly involved with the COVID-19 communications that are going out to the public. Um, he's been leaving the communications and the marketing um, to me and to my department. Um, he, um, in general, that's, that's how he's worked. Um, he hasn't changed the way he's, he's communicated or his involvement in communications um, just because things have changed due to the COVID-19 outbreak. So this is Giselle, uh, which you both asked to see that. So we have two presidents and a chancellor. Uh, the, the involvement varies just depending on how our uh, marketing team wants them involved. 
most of what they've been doing that is related to um, our marketing strategy, whether it's internal for retention or for recruitment, uh, does come from our office. Uh, we always ask them if they'd like to be involved, um, and then if they say yes, and most of the time, you know, they're going to say yes. So we've done everything from videos that are speaking to the students or videos that, where they're speaking to the employees um, to, uh, uh, to you know, messaging. We may help them with, you know, with, you know certain messaging or even uh, their town hall meetings for their respective audiences. So yes, they're involved. Uh, the ideas are coming from our office. And uh, they're usually very open to anything that we propose that, that would fit into the goals and that would help reach our goals right now for recruitment and retention. And again, just overall, just getting just getting our message out um, to our different audiences, whether it's in, whether it's internal or external. Thank you both. Our next question. Is your marketing a pronged approach to engage prospective adult, adult, adult learners versus traditional students? This is this is Crystal. Um, I just would like to just pop in and say, you know, I think what we're realizing is that the displaced worker is that working adult, is that person that may, uh, and could be even be a small business owner. So I think we've always had it in our, in our tracks to promote to working adults. Now really is our time to serve them to our best ability by that messaging. Um, you know, someone might have only been able to uh, enroll in school part-time because they were forced, you know, they had to work um, and they had to keep a, a job during that time. Well, maybe now is an opportunity for them. Uh, maybe they have been laid off or displaced as a worker. Now is that time to kind of bring them in as a um, student. So I think we've always, as colleges, I think we've always thought about messaging. We always wanted to include them. But now this is kind of their time to shine as a, as a prime audience for enrollment. And this is Grace at Peninsula so. College. Uh, yes, I would. I absolutely uh, agree with what Crystal is saying. That is something that we have been working on for all of our marketing and communications. Is we're always trying to to have that pronged approach where we're thinking about both groups of audiences. So we do a a running start program is what our high school students for dual enrollment they can be taking college classes and be getting credit for high school, but also getting their AA degree at the same time um, and looking at, particularly for summer, university students that might be home for the summer. So we're always running those along with running the marketing communications towards those adult learners. Um, you know, in a rural and remote community, we have a, a lot of adult learners that um, maybe might be looking to upskill you know, maybe they have a they have a job that doesn't pay great, um, or they have a, a job that um, is in retail or in in some other industry where they're they're looking to maybe move up their skills a little bit and move up their pay a little bit. Um, so that's something that we've always kept in mind with our marketing to to make sure that we're hitting both of those different audiences. Great. Here's our next question. Is there a best practice of getting name and address lists expediently of 2020 high school graduate, not including a CT list? This is Liz, I'll jump in. Um, recognizing that I'm not doing this on campus <laughs> right now with folks, but I know some of my colleagues at firms that run uh, lead generation websites for colleges, um, like College Express and Niche and things of that nature, might have this sort of thing available right away. And I would think that people who were previously looking up four-year institutions on those sites might be amenable to messages from community colleges. Thank you for that. This is great. Go ahead. So this is Grace. Um, you know, 
We haven't used purchase lists very much, um, again, because we're rural and remote. Um, we've had really good success with our own internal college lists. Um, not only are they cost effective, right? They don't they don't cost us anything to purchase those lists, um, but be, because most of our students are local, we get some athletes that might come here um, from other states or other areas of the state. But, but since most of our students already are here in our service district, we just because our budget is small, we just haven't spent the money to purchase any of those other additional lists because we, we do well with the internal lists that we already have. And I would, this is Crystal, I would also just add very, one very quick tip, you guys, that if you are in an area where generally the high school students that attend the high school live near it, so in some cases we have a lot of very big metro areas where you may be three miles from a high school, but you're actually going to attend a high school 12 miles from you. That wouldn't necessarily work for this, but we do have a lot of schools that, you know, if you live within, you know, so many miles or you're in that school district, you have to attend that high school. We've actually done back to that geofence piece where we've actually geofenced high, feeder high schools up to six, seven miles around each school. And then we're able to capture those devices and serve them. So you're going to get the high school students, but you also get the parents and you'll get some other pieces involved in there too. Maybe people attending some sporting events. So it's not going to be a very detailed list, um, but you can reach some of those people if you're looking at without having to spend the money on an actual high school list. We got a follow up question to that. Does do your high schools provide the list? No, so we, this is something that you could do without having to work with that high school to provide just the list of seniors. Obviously, if you have relationships with your outreach team, they have relationships with the high schools. We do have a lot of K-12 partners that say, yeah, no problem, we'll give you that list of seniors. Um, you know, so obviously if, if that's an option, but we run into this a lot where we just don't have that opportunity um, and so again, we will we will geofence, especially high schools during you know not right at this time, but during a high school event, during conference sports, um, any of those kinds of things where there's opportunities where they will gather in masses. That would be an opportunity to kind of capture those devices and serve them. Thank you for that. And I'll move on to our next question for virtual campus tours. Are you using video on YouTube or working with vendors like you visit? Um, I can just again ping in you guys um, for for videos. We're using drone footage. We're trying to capture something a little bit more authentic does not mean you can't use a vendor, just obviously do dollars are tight. We're always looking for ways to be fiscally responsible. Um, so we do have, and we actually have, in some of these college campuses, we actually have drone cl like classes to teach you how to fly a drone. So we've taken advantage of some of those opportunities, posted them on YouTube and shared them there, and then obviously on our social media. And this is Grace. Uh, occasionally we use a vendor, but yeah, again, dollars are tight, right? So. Um, we've had really good success uh, of doing kind of what I call slideshow videos. Um, so we will at least once a year try to hire a professional photographer to take photos of our students, of our campus, um, of commencement, and then we use those still photos in all of our ads, including our video ads where um, there can be different treatments that are zooming in, zooming out, or how you transition from one still photo to the next along with voiceover and music that is both cost effective, um, looks good. Um, we're use, using resources in multiple ways and really stretching our dollars. So we've had good success with that, that strategy. And now our next question. Do you have thoughts of how we should be using social media right now? Or do you have examples of colleges or universities who are doing a good job during the pandemic? This is Liz, I can answer that briefly and I'm sure other folks will chime in. 
Um, I think the, the best use of social media right now is for a couple of things. Um, one is constant communication and reassurance. Uh, the briefing that we just put out uh, today definitely looked at the, this idea of students wanting to know what's happening. Um, and one announcement is not enough. They need to know that um, that you're talking about the future and what might happen and that you're considering multiple possibilities, even if you're holding the line of, of what your decision is for fall right now. So just regular communication and feeling like you're accessible is one thing. Um, the other thing is to showcase what an authentic student experience looks like. So if you are able to share content from students who are making the most of their experience right now or are looking forward to the summer or the fall, um, students look to social media to understand if they think they're going to fit in somewhere. Um, so if you're talking about organic social content, not necessarily just your paid ads, but others are talking about earlier, uh, showing what it is like to either be on campus or be connected to campus in a virtual environment is what is really going to resonate with folks. Um, for examples of what's really going well, there, there are lots of examples out there. I definitely would recommend checking out the Campus Sonar blog at campusonar.com. Um, you'll see a variety of different institution types and what folks are doing, um, and I'm sure others here have uh, ideas and input as well. This is Grace. Yeah, I absolutely echo what, what Liz just said, you know, um, the just being out there and, and assuring students that you are operating, you are there to support them, here's the creativity that faculty, staff um, are, are doing in this online remote work environment, um, and students as well. Um, in fact, I just had to decline a request yesterday for two new college social media accounts. Our student life wanted a Facebook account and wanted an Instagram account of their own because they wanted to, to start posting more as a way to engage with students. Um, and, and our take on that was absolutely, let's increase our engagement and our presence out on social media, but let's do it on the main social media accounts that the college already has established so that way we can have that message of we are together. Here are all of the different things that we're doing in one place rather than having current students and potential students and the community needing to look in multiple places to see those messages. And we have one more question that we'll have to get to quickly. Um, are you all promoting for residents on your campuses for the fall? This is Grace. I can just chime in briefly. We do not have any on-campus housing, um, so in, in, a, in a way that's a, a bit of a blessing um, that we're not having to, to deal with that challenge. Um, so, so we haven't been talking about that at Peninsula. This is Giselle, so I ditto those comments, so we don't have any you know, residents. Thank you both for providing the information you can, though. We really appreciate it. Um, and I do want to thank everyone for joining us, and a huge thank you to our presenters. They jumped in on this opportunity to share their expertise and work quickly to get the information to us um, for all of you this week. We will be sending a recording of today's webinar to everyone that registered via email. Be checking your email for more information about next week's webinar, Virtual Networking, in this series. And if you're not an MCCA member but would like to receive updates about this series, please subscribe for our updates at mccatoday.org backslash newsletter. You can also learn more on our website, mccatoday.org, and click on the coronavirus banner at the top of the page. Feel free to share these webinars with anyone and everyone. They are complimentary. We are developing these in real time, so there will be changes and updates. Please check in with us often. And of course, we will send you notifications about these changes as well. 
please connect with us if there's any other way we can serve you during this time. We have also created an online forum you can access through your member portal. You can share and gain useful resources here. Again, you can share today's experience on social using hashtags MCCA webinar, Better Together in COVID-19. Thank you all again uh, for joining us today and have a great day.